feel free to ask questions. Now, let's welcome tonight's speaker, Dora Lepe. Thank you. Can you guys hear me pretty well? Yeah. Because I kind of feel weird with a mic, so if I, because I, I like to walk around, so if you can hear me okay, then I, I think I'm okay without the mic. So um, first of all, thank you very much for allowing myself and Evelyn Castro. She is one of our family members. She's been in the business for 20 years now. Um, so she's been serving our community, and um, she enjoys what she's do what she does. Like I said, we're here not to sell. We're just here to give you information, kind of educate you a little bit on pre-planning, the importance of pre-planning. We'll give you a little information about wills and estates, and I'm not an attorney, so don't try to, to sue me by that, I'm just joking, but I just try to give you some information and make some light of a very difficult subject. I think us as Americans, this is one subject we do not like to talk about. We don't like to plan, we don't like to really think about our final wishes, but it is something that's going to happen to all of us we just don't know when and how. But we do know we all will leave this earth at some time. Like Reverend Pete um, said, I got into this business because unfortunately I lost my 21-year-old daughter to leukemia. She was a healthy child, was going to school to become a nurse, and got sick within a year. Um, she went through chemo, so she was 20. Her 21st birthday, they thought she was better. Um, and unfortunately, she didn't die from leukemia, but she died because of the causes of chemo. She, her spleen ruptured, and they didn't know that she was bleeding internally. So I'm grateful that she didn't suffer because it went so quickly, but it, it also was a shock because we thought she was getting better. So it was something we were not prepared for, my husband and I. You never think you're gonna bury your children. And you always think your children are gonna bury us. So that's why I think I really got very passionate about educating and talking about pre-planning because it is something that's very important that we all need at some point. And when you pre-plan, there are a lot of elements that come into that. You lock in today's prices, you can make comfortably monthly payments, and then you leave a clear roadmap of what your wishes are for our loved ones. So I'm going to read a little story. You will all get this, so you don't have to worry about writing notes. We will pass out brochures with all of the information that I'm going to read and then go over. And like I told Reverend Pete, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. I don't care if I get interrupted. I'm that kind of person that when I have a question, if they're not called, if I'm not called on, I might forget it. So I have no problem for you to raise your hand and say, Dora, can you clarify this or I need an answer for this. So like I said, I'm going to read a short story, not line by line, but the story will be in the, in the literature that we're going to give to you so you could read it at your leisure. But it is a true story. And like I said, we are from Chapel of the Chimes in Hayward. We are under the umbrella of North Star Memorial Group, which owns 72 funeral and cemeteries throughout the United States and Hawaii. So let's say you say, okay, I'm gonna plan something, I'm gonna purchase some plot or a niche, whatever your, or your wishes are, and you hit the lottery and you're gonna to move to Florida. I guarantee you we have 37 funeral and cemetery homes in Florida. So that can go with you. So some people think, you know, what if I buy something and I move, the trust can go with you. Or you can also sell it if you like, or you can leave it for a loved one, okay? But I'm gonna read a short story and then we'll get into the questions and answers. So like I said, this is a true story about Sarah and Robert. Sarah was a high school art teacher ready to start enjoying her retirement after 35 years of teaching in San Francisco. She was looking forward to visiting friends, going on hikes, traveling, and painting at her leisure. Sarah was a divorcee and had one daughter named Lindsay who lived in San Francisco near her. She was an executive at a large bank and was very bright and like a lot like her mother. One day, Lindsay was at work 
as she encountered a older, charming young gentleman named Robert, who was an IT specialist doing some work at the bank for a few days. After getting to know Robert, Lindsay thought he would be a good match for my mom. I wonder if I can set them up on a blind date. So she thought it was gonna be harder to convince her mother. So she asked Robert first, you know, if he was married or, and he happened to be a widow and had two children that lived back east. So she thought, perfect. Now I just gotta convince my mom. So she talked to Robert about Sarah and he said, why not? I'll go on a blind date before I go back home. So Lindsay convinced her mom to go on a blind date with Robert. Sarah and, and Robert went on a blind date, hit it off, and rewind 14 months later, Robert proposes to Sarah. Robert was quite the planner, so he was planning their wedding in Maui, a place that he considered paradise on earth. And remember I said Robert had two children, Jason and David, who lived back east. So it was gonna be a small intimate wedding, more like a family vacation. So the wedding was set, they all flew to Hawaii, they had their wedding reception, and at the wedding reception, Robert again thanked Lindsay for introducing him to his best friend and his wife. Robert also made the announcement that he was going to be retiring and that Sarah and Robert were going to move to Hawaii. So once they came back to San Francisco, they were gonna start looking for a realtor to look for some homes in Hawaii. Fast forward a few months after their wedding, they set the date to go to Maui to look at homes. They set up a realtor and she had their schedule Monday through uh, Wednesday to look at homes to see what they were gonna like. Monday, they arrived in Hawaii. They went to go look at some houses, but nothing was quite what they were looking for. So they went again on Tuesday, and again, Robert said, you know, I'm not feeling something that's very friendly. The house needed to be big for all of the kids to come visit. So the realtor said, you know, why don't you take Wednesday off? I'll look for some more house, some more listings, and then we'll proceed on Thursday. And Sarah and Robert thought that was a good idea because Robert felt a little winded. He thought it was maybe the climate. If anybody's been to Hawaii, it's kind of muggy sometimes. So he thought it was just a little warm for him. So on Wednesday, they woke up and decided to just cool, stay, stay by the pool and relax and FaceTime the kids and let them know what was going on. So they were FaceTiming the kids, had breakfast in bed, and were just gonna hang out by the pool all day. So they got down to the pool Sarah was quite the reader, so she had her book in hand, and they were just lounging around when Sarah said, you know, I wouldn't mind having a smoothie. So Robert says, being quite the gentleman to his new bride, said, I'll go grab it for you. So he goes in the lobby to get the smoothie, and Sarah's still by the pool, she hears a loud whistle. And you know, like most people who get curious, wondering what's going on, there was a lot of commotion, but nothing seemed visible by the pool. So everybody started gathering, getting up, and there was something going on in the lobby. So as curious as some of us are, Sarah also got up to go see what the commotion was. And when she got into the lobby, to her despair, she saw Robert lying on the floor. Robert had had a heart attack. The, the, the doctor from the hotel was doing CPR and the ambulance was on, his way, on their way. Robert was, did not pass, but he was not responsive. The ambulance came to pick up Robert and they took uh, Sarah with him. Once she got to the hospital, they put uh, Robert into the trauma room and they took Sarah aside and said, is there somebody that you need to call? Well, remember, they were by the pool, so she only had her book with her. And I don't know about you guys, but like Sarah, we don't remember people's phone numbers anymore. Everything's in our cell phone. So it took her a while to get a hold of her daughter, Sarah, to let her know what had happened. And she finally got a hold of Sarah to tell her to please call the boys to let them know that Robert had had a heart attack. Remember, Sarah and Lindsay were very close. Lindsay was trying to figure out how she could get to Hawaii to be with her mom. 
As they hang up the phone, Lindsay's trying to book a flight to Maui when the phone rings again and it's her mother, hysterically crying that Robert had passed away. So Lindsay now had to call the boys to let uh, Jason and David know that their father had passed. And in that conversation, David tells Lindsay that he remembers his dad saying he wanted to be cremated. And she said, okay. And then when she talked to Jason, Jason said he remembers his dad saying he wanted to be laid to rest next to their mother in Boston. So two different scenarios, same brothers. Lindsay gets to Maui to be with her mother. And the first thing that one of the medical staff asked her is if they have any funeral arrangements. So Lindsay being quite tech savvy gets on her phone to try to find a funeral home. She finds a funeral home, but the funeral home directs her and tells her you need to find a cemetery. So she calls the cemetery to find out how much it would cost to bring Robert's body back to San Francisco. Since they didn't know what quite to do because they had two different scenarios, they thought the best thing would be is to bring Robert back to San Francisco and then they can plan something with the boys. Once Lindsay and Sarah found out how much the cost would be to transport Robert back to California, Lindsay drops to her knees and thinks that's just way too much. So they decide to cremate Robert and bring him back to San Francisco. So they had to wait three days in Maui for Robert to be cremated. And then Lindsay and Sarah arrive in San Francisco with Robert's cremated remains. Robert's two boys were not too pleased with the decision that was made. But like I said, with the cost factor, that was the best decision that Sarah thought that they should have made. Once they got back to San Francisco, they were ready to arrange a celebration of life for Robert. It was gonna be private, but they were gonna have some family and friends. Once they called David and Jason to let them know about the celebration, David told them that he would not be attending. Sarah and Lindsay were devastated because they didn't know if Robert, if David wasn't attending due to cost factors, due to work, or due to the decision that they had made that maybe didn't set so well with them. So they were devastated by those news, and then they also got the news that Robert had appointed Lindsay as his executor. Maybe he picked Lindsay because she was worked at a bank, so he thought maybe she was you know, a saver, she knew what to do with money. So he picked Lindsay as his executor and the boys didn't really like that idea too much either. After the celebration of life, Lindsay and Sarah were devastated because not only did Sarah lose her best friend and her new husband, they've also lost the new two boys that were now their, their extended family. Sarah and Lindsay opened up a letter that Robert had sent, left her with the card of the attorney that had all of his wishes. Sarah and Lindsay called the attorney to make an appointment to go meet with him. After Lindsay gets to the attorney's office to read the will, Robert states, if I pass, when I pass, I would love to be buried in the place that I consider paradise on earth, Mal. Mm. So after reading that, Lindsay even felt more sick to her stomach because obviously they made another decision that was not what Robert wanted. Like I said, this is a brief story and the whole story I will give to you guys. But the, we, the reason we picked this story is because it brings up so many key points of our mission of trying to educate and train people with the importance of pre-planning. So I want to ask you guys, yeah, please don't be shy because I don't want to just hear my voice. How much do you think it would cost right now, February 2020, to bring a body from Hawaii to San Francisco? 10,000. 10, Anybody else? Fifteen. I also.
also her 50. So I will say we're all in the first right class, church, first different class pew. First class, first class seat. First class. First class. <laughs> so we're talking almost 22,000. And you're going to say, Dora, why? What's the cost factor? Well, the cost factor is that when someone dies in another state or in another country, that person, if their body's going to come back, has to be, first of all, embalmed, second of all, into a casket, into an air freight casket. So the casket has to go into another air freight train. Then there are permits for every state that that body is going to transport. transport to, correct? And then there is an airfare. Even though the body goes where the luggage is, people don't know that, um, there's still a fee. And sometimes the fee is more than your actual ticket. So that's where you come up with this dollar amount. So that's why we tell people there are so many things that we can do. If you're a traveler, we sell an insurance. It's a one-time fee for $495 and it will cover you anywhere in the United States or in the, in the world. So if someone passes in Paris, in the Philippines, in Mexico, in New York, in Los Angeles, that insurance will cover to bring the body back to Chapel of the Chimes in Hayward for that one-time fee. As long as you're being buried there. Um, well, you don't have to be buried there, but most, most of the time they are because the insurance will bring you, but we could still transport the body somewhere else. But most of the people do have everything there, but you don't have to. That's a good question, you don't have to. So once again, like I said, obviously they made decisions based on money because they didn't have that money visible to them at the time. Why do you think it's not a good idea to put your final wishes in a will or a living trust? Very good. Obviously, a will and a living trust is a good idea to put your wishes, but normally that is read after the fact. After we've passed, after we've done whatever celebration of life, so it's normally read after. And if our wishes are there, we might have, they, our family members might have made the wrong decision because they didn't know. So another question when we come to that, do you know the difference between a will and a living trust? Yes. Yeah. What is it? The living trust is the first story you get that property or whatever it is. The will, thank you, sure there's no taxes. The will okay. is they're going to designate somebody to get it from her, and there are, uh, there are taxes involved. Part of this is very true. The biggest difference is because you can do a will on, on the internet for less than $150. But a living trust, if you have to go to a family law attorney, depending on how much, how much we have, whether you have homes, properties, or banks, can cost you anywhere from $1,200 to $5,000. Can you not make your trust yourself by going on the internet or not? Well, see, the difference is a, a living trust gets registered in the county in which you live in. Yes, so, but then when your uh, person is, your mind is correct, when they can do it. I, I have to be honest, like I said, I'm not an attorney, but most of the time you can, but you still have, it has to get registered in the county because that's why, that's how those items that are in that living trust don't go into probate. That's the difference. So that's one of the biggest difference because a will and a living trust, you're, living, you're leaving your final wishes, you're leaving who you want to leave X, Y, and Z to, but the difference is a living trust is registered into that county. Okay. Well, and but you know your assets are also registered into your trust. What? All the assets that you want in the trust are registered into oh, yeah. the trust, not yeah. in your name. Yeah. Correct, no, yeah. yeah. But I was just trying to say the difference, because some people say, well, I have a will which is good, at least right. it's something. But a will can be contested, a will can be fought. So that is the difference, that a living trust gets registered, handed to the county, and they record it. But couldn't you register your own will? Your own trust. trust. Your own trust? Your own will. No, will. No, will. You cannot. The only thing you could do with the will 
is you can um, have it notarized that everything you're saying and that your signature is true. Well, usually they are. Plus, the trust is revocable. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. So the, the reason I get to that is, do we have Only an idea? Only you're alive. <laughs> do we have an idea of how many executors you should pick? Two. Two, one. The answer is three. Yep. You should have three. So you have your primary, and then you have two alternates. Because unfortunately, the way things are now, people sometimes die younger. Sometimes people get a divorce. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people that you've chosen no longer are in your life. So you at least want to have three. And how often do you think you should check and review a will and a living trust? Every five years. That's good. Every year. Every year. Because of the same factor that now people are dying, people are moving away, and you just want to make sure that everything that you have in there is still current. Like I said, maybe I could have picked Judy because she was my neighbor and she helped me out, and now Judy's not there and I haven't changed anything, it's still going to be Judy. So that's why. And the other big thing, uh -huh. yeah, um, it, it, is it advisable to check on your attorney standing who made your trust if the attorney made it years ago? Yes. 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 Because ours was disbarred. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, that's a very good question. And the only reason I would say yes is because my auntie just had to go through that. She, my uncle passed away 10 years ago. She obviously was gonna leave everything to her two kids, son and daughter. Well, her son is no longer really in, his, in her life. So now she says, I wanna leave everything to my daughter. So we, I took her to see the attorney and he had to literally write a whole new living trust because my uncle was still on it. She never had, you know, updated it. Well, so, it would be hard to update. No, but they had to change it because now she was leaving more to her daughter. So it had to be changed and there was a $1,250 fee. So there is a fee when you change when you change your living trust. I thought when you had your living trust notarized that that was registering that. Is that not the same? A notary is different than a living trust being registered through the county because then it's recorded. Where do you go to register? Normally an attorney, that's why they charge so much, but they do all of that. Oh. They, pre they prepare the living trust, they make sure that it's correct <laughs> and what you want, and then they submit it, a copy to the state. Yeah. 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 I, I so, didn't have an attorney. Okay. I didn't, so, we oh, okay. Well, I had paid $500 to get my living trust made. Why is the expenses so much better? It was not a lawyer. It was a company that specializes in making living trusts. Well, and, and that's fine. I mean, as long as you have something and it is a living trust and it's registered, then you're fine, whatever the fee was. Because there are some ch um, ch churches or place of worship that get attorneys that come and will do it for their parishioners for half the price. So the, the fee isn't the point. I was just trying to make the point that the fees can vary depending on the attorney. Just make sure your parents know you have it. I know that we... We've updated our living trust a couple of times by typing up a legal statement that, of how we want things changed, and we sent it to our attorney. And I know he got it because he acknowledged it by saying, "I guess you're trying to save money." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But he had he, he was required to yes. incorporate it. Yes. You know, and we had that all in our. Document. Yeah. Any changes? Some he must be a nice. Some of them will make you come in because they do yeah, want to yeah. charge you that yeah, fee no, because no. then they have to submit yeah. that again to the, to the not, county. He was not happy, but I'm keeping that letter. <laughs> and see, this brings up a question. If we feel comfortable in picking Evelyn as our executor, we, should, we obviously trust her then, right? Or whomever we pick. If you pick them to carry out your wishes, do all of your financials, you obviously trust that person. So I say we need to empower that person. That person needs to know what our wishes are. Because when we don't say what our wishes are then, that is how we have chaos yes. once we pass. And, and Judy and I talked about this a little. 
because Evelyn and I see this sometimes on a weekly basis. A family walks in and says, mom and dad have everything paid for. They, they've, got, they've taken care of everything. Um, then we pull the file and know mom and dad really just have a plot. They don't have the opening and closing. They don't have a funeral trust. So the kids are saying, well, I'm not, I can't pay for it. Well, you're going to pay for it. Or who's going to pay? Well, if you're the executor, then you pay for it. You know, we see that all the time. So I always tell families, if you trust the person enough to be your executor, empower them. I'm not saying give them the key to your safe, give them all your bank accounts, but let them know where to go find everything because they're going to have to make all these decisions. And also, if you have more than one ch child or if you have sisters, siblings, inform them of your wishes. Because if you don't do it, then when we pass and they have issues, there is going to be arguing. There is going to be, I hate to be fighting sometimes. And families are still trying to grieve through the loss of their loved one, but yet they're bickering over who's going to pay for this, why did mom leave you this and not me? Why did you get the car and I got the boat? Whatever the case may be. So we need to make sure that we're, yeah, that we're clear on our wishes. Um, another big thing too is there are a lot of documents that need to be in one place. Uh, Evelyn, if you want to start you're handing them out, that um, your loved ones are going to have to have once we pass. Some of those documents, and we're going to give them to you, so you'll get them all. But it, either your will or your living trust, um, your financial dual power of attorney with health care. How many of you guys have your health care with dual power of attorney? Very good. If you don't, I'm not promoting Kaiser, but Kaiser is one that I went to one of their trainings. Most of your uh, health care providers will not charge you a fee. So they will give you a document that you sign on appointing who you want to make decisions if you mentally can't make decisions, if you have a breathing tube and you can't speak. So they'll give you a, a form to fill out that has to be notarized and then it goes back to Kaiser or whomever it is and it's there in your records so they know who's going to make decisions for you. So they need you, they would also need to have a marriage license, a divorce, if anybody's in the military, military paperwork, if you have a deed, mortgage, um, your social security number, your mother's maiden name, all of those all of that information is for the death certificate. So sometimes some spouses, some kids don't know mom's maiden name, mom's mother's maiden name, or where their social security is. So all of that information needs to be in one place, okay? And like I said, we're gonna give you a copy of, of all of the documents, in, it's in the folder. So, um, so, why do you think it would be very important to pre-plan, to plan your final wishes? Anybody? Why, why, would, why would it be important for us to pre-plan right now if we think we're pretty healthy, you know, we're, we're going to live for a few more years, I'll deal with it, I have life insurance. Go on an airplane. <laughs> well, one of the biggest reasons we say for pre-planning is you leave a clear roadmap of your wishes for your loved ones. So there is no guessing, like with Robert. They didn't know what his final wishes were because they read it after the fact. So if you pre-plan, whether it's with Chapel of the Chimes, whether it's with whomever, I encourage all of you that you're alive and breathing right now, shop around, shop around. Because you can see what there is out there there is traditional burial, and you can be buried in so many different ways. There are crypts that you can be placed in a wall. There is cremation that you can be scattered. You can be taken back home. You can be placed in a niche. So there is... Uh -huh. and, and you can donate your body for medical use. You can, but your body 
to, and I learned this unfortunately with my daughter, you have to be in pretty tip-top shape. No, no, no. I mean, to be practicing for the other for surgeons. Oh, okay, okay. I, excuse I, me, I call that giving back. Giving back, okay, okay. Yeah, that's my plan. Well, that's great. Yeah, because I know with Stanford, when my daughter, we, we had her in the study before she passed, and they had told us that their criteria is pretty high for them to take a body, even just to donate or do other things. So, yes, and there are some companies that will do that. And then if you do that, they will also pay for your memorialization. So they will do a, a memorial for you or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Excuse me. Before you go on to another subject, when we're on that little thing about you know trusts and wills and stuff, um, conservatorship. I, I have a friend who had a, has her one child is not going to ever be able to <coughs> help her, and he needs care. And what is it? How do you do conservatorship? And in other words, they can't give him any power. Yeah. Or, you know, and he's got to really be taking care of the rest of his life in a some. Well, there's two forms, I, and like I said, I'm not an attorney, but there's two forms. Either she appoints a friend, family, or someone that's going to obviously take care of him if something happened to her before he passed, and then to take care of her final wishes and her estate. If not, unfortunately, the state will come in. And especially if he's ill or has issues, then the state does come in and take over. There's a special trust. Oh, they went to a lawyer and they ended up with, I mean, it's not quite finished yet, but I was wondering about it. They ended up with a team because he's disabled more or less. Mm -hmm. But she was very impressed with that. So if they ended up with this, uh, a sort of a conservator as a lawyer, and then this team came in because he's not well. Um, so anyway, I just didn't know if you knew anything. It about is, but sometimes you get into a, a gray area if the attorney is the one that has this team because then it's all in-house and it's no, i think it was uh i think it was a team from social services okay then that's yeah then that's different that that could be sometimes when the state comes in but i thought you meant like this attorney had a team of people that would kind of like take over and help make sure that everything goes well and takes care of because that has happened oh okay no, yeah yeah no the Lawyer um, does all the paperwork, and then social services was the team. Okay, yeah. Through, through, with the judge, and anyway, go ahead. They probably set up a beneficiary trust. It's a, there's, I don't know if I've got the right term, but there's some kind of trust that <coughs> up, um, accommodates for people who are unable to take care of their, their own affairs. And you know, if you have a, a son or daughter who's in yeah. that situation, there's but, a special trust. So that attorney probably set one of those yeah. up. Yeah. Okay, two, essentially two kinds of conservatorship. One is private conservatorship, mm -hmm. and you can go online or, or look at a phone book, find out who are private conservators, and they are pretty costly. Or there's LPS conservatorship, it's Lantern and Petrus Short from legislation way back, and that is through each county. And each county has that normally within their health services department. So that conservatorship then might involve that person with, with a six month, six week review, intensive review, uh, investigation and reports that go to the court, uh, several court appearances, and then that person maybe need to be housed in, within uh, a safety area and there are many hospitals throughout California and other states where people can be safely housed yeah. who are disabled, unable to care for themselves either physically or mentally. And that's the LPS conservatorship, and that's where essentially the state takes over, but the county works through that. So, so do they take, the state takes over the money that you have? To care for those, those, those people, they, they are ineligible. They, I call the LPS conservatorship and a private conservator and discuss that point with them. So I'm not sure where the money fits in there. Yeah. But a lot of times people, if they're homeless or they're disabled or they're already on Medi-Cal because they're low income and somewhat independent, they are the ones primarily. Often they are very mentally disturbed and I did reports for those people for many years and, and they think they're God or Christ or Mary, I can't tell you how many 
paper like that, but people think they're Jesus. I'm, I'm, it's just, I'm, amazed, there's, I'm amazed there's something that, that takes care of these people. There are. There were many there's, more mental there's hospitals. There's so many people on the street. Reagan closed many of them, but there's still yeah. several. I guess the ones on the streets are the people they don't want. Any other well, if, if, if they, they really are bad and they can't be left alone, yeah, that's yeah, what happens. Yeah, yeah. But I guess I was talking more if someone does have a home, if someone does have assets, assets yeah. and you have a child that is ill, you do have to either go private or pick someone, a friend or you know someone from your place of worship. Special needs trust. Yes. That you have that's to, what it is, it's yeah. a special needs trust. Yeah. But yes, you're right. There are a lot of programs for people uh -huh. that are homeless or that are low income. And every county has their own. And I will say, I, you guys are in El Contra Costa. Berkeley has one of the best services for their residents. They do once a month. They have an attorney that comes that does a living trust for free. They give a lot of workshops on all different scenarios. If you have a, a child that's sick, if you have a child that has disabilities, if you're the only person now, say your husband has passed, your children have passed, and it's only you, what you'd like to do. So you have to kind of look into your own county to see what services, because there are a lot of services out there for each county. I'd just like to add one more thing. NAMI, which is the National Alliance for Mentally Ill, has their office in Concord for, for uh, Contra Costa County, uh, close to the, the main park in Concord. And they put on workshops once a month, with, which are free, and they, they talk about things mm -hmm. like that, and they have the professionals who actually do the work come to speak. They are wonderful. So Contra Costa has something okay, to do. Okay, good. That's, I, I'm glad to hear that, because sometimes when I go to different places, I don't know about different um, counties. Uh, on another subject, uh, donating your body to science, uh, from personal experience, is a good idea if you're going to do that, to let everybody in your family know that Correct. that's your yes. intention. Yeah. Because my grandmother did it, and we didn't let the rest of the family know, and some of the family was very upset that we let it happen. Well, yeah. and I think it goes back to this, the, what I'm trying to get to is communication. We have to communicate with our families. Whether we want to donate our body, whether we want to donate our assets to charity, to whomever, you have to let them know. We have to empower them. Because once we tell them if they have an issue, at least I'm still here. And I can tell my children, this is why I picked X, Y, and Z. Once I'm gone, my kids are going to bicker. You know, why did mom do this? Or why did mom didn't do this? So I always think it's very important to also communicate with our loved ones of what our wishes are. My son was in a major accident when he was 22 and he died. It wasn't three till three months later that I got his wallet. Somebody sent it back in the mail. And here's a card on the back of his driver's license saying he wanted his body donated, except for the trauma to his head, which killed him. Then his body would have been perfect. And if we had known, there's an point. But the point here is, not waiting until you get to be my age or this old. It can happen and if you're it's not a child anymore, yeah. when you're yeah. 18 or older. So yeah, totally these yeah. people need to know. Our children, who are adults, need to know this as well. And they don't they tell us. They tell us about them. Yeah, yeah they need yeah. to tell us. Yeah. yeah. Well, the best, I think the best way to handle that is to have it on your driver's license. It was. But, but, it's all but she didn't, she didn't get later. it until later. I got four copies of it. So we copied with my children. And, they, uh, and I discussed all the stuff that was going to get filled and what was going to get what and all the money was going to And nobody objected, and everybody had a copy, so they knew what was going to happen. Yeah. The only thing that's changed is there's some people I won't take it out of the will that have nothing to do with my family and other people that I won't be put in because they've been so good and so generous to me. And that could have cost me another $1,500. Well, it's depending on your attorney. So some I attorney. I don't have an attorney. Oh, I, I had an office that did that. I, I think it that. would be something. I think you could probably get a statement notarized. I think you could write an addendum to your will. Yeah. Yeah. With your will and have a will. No, it's a trust. It's a trust. trust. But you you could write trust. your own addendum. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you just have to make sure, sure that it's registered. I notarized. Yeah, notarized. Yeah, notarized. And registered. And registered. Yeah. yeah. You could register.
register it yourself. The county clerk can Yeah, you can just walk in there. You can, yeah. I think it's twelve dollars. Can you go in and look at what's been registered for yourself? Yes. We should do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that guy's going to be <laughs> yeah, What are you going to be joined? Huh? What are you going to leave me? I don't know. I'll take care of the support. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I don't know. What does a funeral cost? Or a cremation or burial cost? Okay, well, like I said, today we're, 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 we'll give you just variables from one end to another. So if you do a direct cremation, which means there's no service, we pick up the loved one from wherever they pass, bring them into our care, do their cremation, and then a day or so later call the family and say to come pick up the urn. That's $2,390. Twenty two thousand three hundred and ninety dollars for a cremation. Yes. But I will tell you, and like I said, I'm here to give you information, okay, not just to push Chapel of the Chimes. Well, my mom, my mom and dad are there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have you heard of the Neptune Society? Yes. yes. So the Neptune Society will cremate you for nine hundred and ninety-five dollars. So you're going to say, Well, Dora, why are you telling me that if you just told me you're going to charge me twenty-three ninety? Well, I'll tell you why. Chapel of the Chimes, we do not sub out any work. All of the cremation is done on our premises. We have three crematories, so we do everything there. The Neptune Society subs out the cremation. But there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing illegal with that. I just like you know. That's why it's the difference. And then now there's even a new company that's come out in San Francisco called the Tula Foundation. They do cremations for $695. Everything is done through the internet, so there is no interaction with a funeral director. You just- <laughs> buried online. No, one they, they can't bear it. So, I, I like how humorous you guys are. They can't bear it, it's just cremation. But what they do is they'll pick up your loved one from wherever, and you know, then they oh. cremate, and then they mail the uh, urn back to the loved one. With, with your- Comes in a box. Comes in a box. In a bag. In a bag. Yes. We will recommend what does hospice. 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 Yeah. If you're, Hosp in, or if you're in yeah. hospice, they will help your family. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. But you also have to let your family know family know that you are part of one of these societies so yes. that they know what's going on. She's a, a she's an Neptune and I know that now and if she's of somewhere Karen. else. Yeah, and that's why I say it's, it's very important. It is a subject we do not like to talk about. We don't. I, I, I'll be honest. I've been doing this now for nine, almost ten years. She's twenty. We are a society. We plan everything. We can plan birthday parties, celebrations here, but we don't talk about our final wishes. And to me, that is maybe because it hit home. But it is something that's so important because if we don't communicate and plan, we're going to do something regardless. And we have scenarios where we have some families that will overspend because they really want to memorialize mom or dad or grandma and grandpa. So they kind of go overboard. And then we have some families that walk out the room and say, the last person in there is going to have to pull out their credit card because I ain't going to do it. Right. We, we've seen that. We've seen where we had um, a lady that her mom passed, and her mom had told her she wanted to be buried. Once they found out that it was going to cost them about $27,000, the son said, Mom's getting cremated. So that's why I'm telling you, like, like Judith, it's very important to bring it up and talk. It's not that our families are good or bad, but when there's money involved, we change. Everybody changes. Whether you're talking a few hundred dollars, a few hundred thousand dollars, or a million dollars, people change. People get greedy. People want to say, I want to see how much I'm going to get. So that's why I, I repeat, but it's very important to communicate. Even, you know, I'm not saying, but what I did with my family, we had a little potluck. And we were going to talk about, I have three sisters, we we're going to talk about what we want. And we know what my mom wants, because I will say one thing real quick, I, you have a question, but my father died in 1979. 
and we're blessed that the person that helped my mother, my mother was 42 years old, a widow with three girls. She told my mom, buy the plot next to your husband and start pre-planning for yourself. So over 34 years ago, my mom did this. Thank God my mom's still alive and kicking. She's 86. She paid $1,200 for her plot, for her opening and closing, for her funeral. Right now, my mom's plot is worth $26,000. With all those services? Just with the plot. No, no. just the plot. Well, then, okay. You came up with a $27,000 well, because I'm saying where my mother is, it's kind of prime property. Okay. So just like in real estate, there is prime property in a cemetery. There's parking so, under underneath. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? I was I was no, it's okay. You can see the potluck you had like the rest in peace turnovers. And, yeah. Believe it or not, my sister did little things. She made cupcakes and she said, "Rest in peace." One of them said, you're paying for moms, you're doing it. That's a joke that my mom's paying for. But no, the prices vary on depending on location. So we are uh, in Hayward. So when you drive into our location, the closest properties to the street are the least expensive. The more that you go into us and you go up the hill, just like the home up on the hill, we have properties that cost a million dollars. You, you won't have to drive far to see me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and he can tell you because his family left Skyline, which is one of our prime real estate cemeteries. Properties there are in the millions because you're overlooking the Pacific Ocean in some in some areas. So it just depends on the area. Wow. You're not well, getting at anything. I, I've got two plots for sale. <laughs> Well, and you're right, you're not, but I will say one thing, after losing my daughter, we memorialize for the living, not for the dead. Because whatever we believe in, I don't want to get it, but whatever we, live, whatever we believe that happens after, that's our belief. But it's for the living, it's for the grieving, it's for going through the process. For me, this is how I got to this job, I would visit my daughter every night. Every day I'd visit her. And one of the guys came up to me and said, because I worked for Ford Motor Company for 20 years. Working for a car dealership is fun. They're selling cars, people are happy, you know, they're, they're happy to get driving off in their Mustang. So he said, don't you want to work here? I'm like, not really, no, why would you ask me that? Because in my mind I thought a cemetery is kind of gloomy, kind of depressing. Why would I want to do that? A lot of but, people working underneath you. <laughs> <laughs> but after thinking of it, I thought, you know what, no. I want to educate people. I really want people to realize the importance of pre-planning. And it doesn't matter what age we are. We could be in our 30s, we could be in our 40s, we could be in our 50s, we could be in our 70s, 80s. It doesn't matter because we're all going to use it at some point. And when you pre-plan, you lock in today's prices. So like my mom, my, when I started working here, mija means daughter in Spanish. My mom said, mija, can you check out the folder? I want to make sure there's no funny business because I bought this so long ago. So I did, I thought, you know, how do they make money if my mom paid for this, you know, 30 some odd years ago and now they could sell it for 20, you know, 26,000. Well, Everything is locked in. The only thing my sisters and I have to pay for is my mom's um, death certificate because that's through the county and that changes every so often. And any taxes, that's through the state. So that's a very good question. Not on a funeral, but on the cemetery because it's property. So oh, we just have yearly taxes. No, not oh, yearly. No, no. But once we use it, so say my mom paid nine hundred dollars for it, we're just going to get taxed on that nine hundred dollars. But it goes to the state of California. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't pay it at the time you purchase. No, no, no. It's related to sales tax. Yeah. They want it that way because it's going to be worth more. Yeah. But that—that's what. Yeah. I have a weird question. No question is weird. Go for it. I'm going to be cremated. By the way, all my dogs I've ever had have been cremated. And they have to be buried with me. 
That's weird. What animal? So <laughs> in the state of California, we are not allowed to bury pets with humans. Cremation even. Even cremation. But like we tell some people, we're not watching. We're not watching. So we have had people do it. But the state does not permit it because funeral and cemeteries are for humans. Well, what about Neptune Society? Don't they strip the ashes out of the water? They do for a fee, though. So even if they charge you $900 to cremate you, to get scattered is an additional fee. How much is it? Do you have any idea? I know. And, for, um, for Scott Green, yeah. it's uh, $350. For, I'm sorry, did you? $350. Depending on where you scatter. So San Francisco's 350, but if you went to Tahoe, that's a thousand. And if you go to Hawaii, that's almost eighteen hundred dollars to get scattered. My sister in law, this is terrible. Her I mother, love you guys. Her mother her mother loves to gamble in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> she she and her sister just just quietly walk down the main street. They they scattered her on uh, um, what is it? Las Vegas Boulevard. <laughs> and you know, I will say, scattering is is a is a belief or a, a feeling that we have, whatever your wishes may be. The only thing that I say about scattering is at least leave a little so oh, yeah. your loved ones can still visit and memorialize. Like I said, it's not for the dead, it's for the living. Right. Visiting sometimes, like I, even my children, I still have three kids, when they have a bad day, they'll be at the cemetery talking to, even though they talk to their sister all the time, but that's a place where they go that they feel that she, they're more connected to. So that's why I say it's not for us once we're gone, but it's for the living to memorialize, to grieve, to go through whatever process they need to go through. Yeah, just check the fountain at Caesars. Yeah, I'm going to check that now. So I wanted us to do one last thing before we leave, because we've, we've almost been talking, I've been talking for an hour. So in your booklets, if you open up your booklets, there's a workbook. Um, in that workbook, If you turn to the last page, it says drawing exercise. I need some crayons, too. Oh, we didn't bring any. We have a marker. Just way on the back. Just turn it all the way to the back. Drawing exercise. Okay, please don't judge me because I'm not a very good artist, but let's make a big circle in the middle of your paper. Do you need a pen? No, okay. Oh, okay. okay. I'm waiting for my next joke, so you gotta do something <laughs> before we wrap up. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Okay, and inside that circle, I want us to draw seven boxes. Doesn't matter how you draw them. We're not going to share, so don't worry how you draw. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to draw four stick figures, two on each side. One on the right, one, two on the left. I'm sorry, two on each side. Yeah. It's a matter of male or female. You can put a bow on them, you can put a shirt on them, you can put a Speedo on them, whatever you like. And then we're going to do another one on the top left, or your right, on the top. I'm going to put a little wing on that one. Sure. And you're going to do another what? one on the top. What's that one? Uh, just another stick figure, but I put little wings on it, on mm -hmm. my wings. And I'm going to put a bow tie on this, on this stick figure. Sure. So, like I said, we're going to do a little breathing exercise. So everybody, close your eyes. Take a deep breath in, exhale. Take another deep breath in, exhale. One more deep breath. And imagine that was the last breath you took. Everything
anything that we have going on at home will be unfinished. Anything that we have been decided on or made decisions on will be undecided. Someone's going to have to decide what our wishes are. So let's imagine that someone has passed, and this is a table at a funeral home. These are our families, our loved ones. Some of us can have more, some of us can have less, okay? This is a funeral director that's gonna come into the room and say, I'm sorry, Grandma didn't have anything pre-planned. What are your guys' wishes? What would you like to do? And this is where, this is a true statement where we get family members saying, well, what is the least expensive route that we can take? So we'll give them that number. And they'll say, well, no, that's still a little too much. What, what can we do? Can we make payments? Well, no, unfortunately, when someone passes, just like with me with my daughter, we have 48 hours to pay everything in full. Or they won't, they won't proceed. And unfortunately, they, they can start talking. Even if there's life insurance? Well, I'll, I'll get to that too right now about the life insurance. So the only person in this room that really knows what we wanted is us. But we're here and we can't tell them. We can't direct them on which direction to go. Now, let's say, good question, that he walked in and daughter said, mom had life insurance. How, how do we proceed? Well, this is how we proceed. Most life insurance companies want a death certificate before they pay out any money. A death certificate's going to take anywhere from seven to ten days from the time of death. That is why we say it is great to have life insurance, but life insurance is not for funeral and cemetery because of that fact. If you have life insurance, I encourage you to call them and ask them what are their requirements when someone passes. Do they need a death certificate or will they pay out the funds and wait the 20 days to get a life, uh, a death certificate. New York Life, I don't work for them, but they are one company that does give that. So say a family walked in and said, grandma had life insurance, we will honor that, they will pay us, and then the difference gets a check to the family. But that, there, there's very few companies that do that with life insurance. So that's why we say, Life insurance is not a good idea for funeral and cemetery. So let's take another scenario. Let's say grandma had come and met with Evelyn and pre-planned everything. The director walks in and says, I'm here to help you going through the grieving process. Grandma has done everything. I just need a few signatures then we can do everything Grandma wanted, and now we're here to help you in any way we can to start memorializing your grandma, the grieving process, because there are a lot of different steps in grieving. There is not just one cookie cutter. You know, they say there are seven steps. Some people get angry, some people get depressed, some people get sad, some people just shut down. They, they don't want to deal with anything. So that's why we're here to help them. But unfortunately, when they still have to make all of the decisions, that's just more stress on the family more anger. because they don't know what to do. And like I said, we have some families that will overspend. They want to do the best of the best for grandma. And maybe grandma didn't want that. And then we have some families that can't have that luxury that maybe grandma wanted to be buried, but they can only afford to cremate her. So that's why I say, and I, and I thank Judy that she keeps telling me that it's very important that we communicate with our families. Tell them what our wishes are. Tell them I'm going to leave you the boat and you my jewelry. Whatever the case may be. That way if they have an issue with that, then you can address it now that you're here. Because you don't want them to address it amongst them. Because we see this time and time again when families stop talking to one another. At a time when we should be united, when they've lost someone, and that, that grieving, that loss should unite us, and more, a lot of times it just divides us. And it all comes down to the mighty dollar. So that's why I say it's very important for us 
to pre-plan, leave a clear roadmap, and communicate with your loved ones, and whatever that may be. And don't buy any new cars just before you get to the road. <laughs> 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 well, right over there. <laughs> I told my wife to put some money in the box with me, and she said, well, how about if I just leave you a credit card and a checkbook? <laughs> <laughs> Well, does anybody have any questions? Like I said, we are here just to give information. If you want deeper information or prices, Evelyn can give you some of that. We are, I'm not here to discuss it. I was just here to give you guys some information. And like I said, right now you're alive and breathing. Shop around, shop around and see what's best for you and your family. And for any of you that have already pre-planned, I applaud you because you have given your family one of the best gifts. That they don't have to go through all of that drama, if you want, to figure out what to do with mom or dad or grandma or grandpa. Yeah. Uh, just so I'm clear, because I, I'll ask you for myself, I'll ask you for a friend. She cannot do a trust herself and then register it and have her signed by the proper authorities. She cannot do a trust by herself. Is that what you're telling me? No, what I'm telling you is that she can do it, but there's a lot of legwork that she's going to have to do because she still has to get it a legal document. She can then go to the county and register it, but that's why the fee for a family law attorney is kind of high because they do all of that. They do that for her. So she can basically do it and she has to go to the court get it approved and registered. Correct. A living trust, correct. It has to be registered I in that case. I use one of those, those online products, so, you know. Uh, it would be better not to just try to write it up yourself, but to get... You can get a formula. A formula, yeah. There's some yeah. companies out there that have... Well, you just want to make sure that the company is a legit company. Yeah. Yeah. Because, unfortunately, there are a lot of companies out there and attorneys that scam Elderly people, unfortunately. Yeah, that's, that, that's one thing that you, you, you might research for your next presentation. Uh, which one do you think might be good? Uh, well, you've asked, so many people have asked that, and I guess my boss doesn't want us to get into uh, the legality of saying go to this guy right. or go to that guy because that's not fair either. That's not right. Uh, I wonder how you would bet that The best that. way to do it is if you Yelp a family law attorney, Yelp is a really good resource because it does tell you what a person that has gone through, if they liked the experience, didn't like them, you can look them up to see in the bar in the sense if he's still a, a good attorney, if he's been disbarred, if No, but I mean these products that are you know, oh. you know, documents that you just fill out. Oh, you can still research them. Yeah. I mean, Yelp probably still has some. Probably still has some. Legal Zoom is the place that they have yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I hope everybody feels better prepared than before or if not feel the need to be better prepared and I feel like you know I have to write down my will or living trust or anything, or anything tonight which will make me probably the youngest Asian man who wrote his will in the United States. I also appreciate the questions and comments shared during the Q&A session. I think Q&A uh, Q was uh, also very you know, helpful, right? Yeah. yeah. Jesus said to Martha, who was mourning, grieving for, bro for her brother Lazarus, who passed away, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who, be who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? When he said it, he meant the resurrection and eternal life, the life that will, come, that will continue after this life in Father's house, our heavenly home. Our life here on earth may end, but for those who remain in the hearts of our children and grandchildren, our legacy will continue. That legacy being not only our financial resources, but also the words of encouragement to our beloved family and our examples of faith, which we demonstrated through our words and actions. As we close, I invite you to think about our last day, the moment we'll make our final wishes in our deathbed, surrounded by our family. I hope and pray that we all remain so confident and grateful on that day that we all live on this earth, not only financial resources for which uh, they will be grateful, but also in the, in the pre plan that we had. <laughs> but also much needed legacy that is faith, hope, and love for which they will be forever grateful. Amen. Let's, let's, now let's close with tonight's nice events with prayer. Let's pray. Merciful God, we give you thanks for this gathering where we learn how to better prepare ourselves and our children for our last day. Give us wisdom as we plan and envision that day. Give us courage to write in our will, in our letters to our children, what our hearts desire for their very future for their life eternal, and give us longing for entering into your kingdom and your presence. Let Dora's work be a channel of your blessing so that Erica's life may be honored every time she stands in front of people and teaches them how to prepare their last day. Help us, all of us, to live out our faith and honor your son who gave his own life for us on the cross. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.